Hello, this is Lessons of the Sixties, a project to document activism in Washington, D.C. from 1960 to 1975. Uh, today we're interviewing Larry Aronson, uh, who was a longtime Washington person. He was a native of Washington, D.C. and a longtime teacher. Uh, the interviewers will be Norma Lesser and myself, Ann Gallivan, and today is January 26, 2018. Okay, so we get started. Uh, Larry, uh, you're down here for from Boston, where you now live, um, for a bunch of uh, different events in your family. But you did grow up in Washington D.C. So we want to start start by asking you, what was it like growing up in Washington D.C. in the '50s and the '60s for you? <coughs> the '40s and the '50s. '40s and the '50s and the '60s. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. It, it was a Jim Crow town, but uh, Washington was a segregated town, right? It wasn't segregated in the same way that the Deep South was segregated. Mm -hmm. um, but but what was segregated were hotels. Most of the public, most of the private public accommodations, the movie theaters, the restaurants, all of that was segregated, right? Um, and there was very little knowledge between black and white people in their lives, right? So when I, I grew up it, uh, um, on 14th and Military Road, right beside an apartment house, an apartment complex, it was sort of project-like for government workers. I believe that that's who that complex was for, mostly. I might be wrong about that. Um, right next door to the Military Road Elementary School for black and white colored boys and girls. With colored boys and girls was part of the... Yeah the name of the school. And the reason why I bring that up is because the, our apartment had a sandbox for the little kids. I was like one, two, three, four, and five, right? And next, and there was an iron rod fence. And on the other side of that iron rod fence was the school's uh, sandbox, right? And at the age of three, we're playing in one sandbox. And on the other side of the fence, the black boys and girls are playing in their sandbox. And it always occurred to me, and this is the white supremacy that's embedded in the culture, that, that there was a reason that fence was there separating us. And not only was there a reason for that, <clears throat> something in my world inferred to me, told, told me, that those kids were inferior to me and there's a reason why they should be separated from but us. But your parents didn't tell you that. No one said that directly, right. And we never even talked, I don't recall us ever talking to one another. About that, <clears throat> when I look back on all of that time, that's that's a very large picture in my mind, right? That that school was, and I went to Brightwood, which is right up the street, right mm -hmm. from the from yes. that uh, elementary school, which was of course segregated, right? And this is Northwest Washington, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I was clueless, witless, and mindless about race. Okay, um, the thing, the exception to that was. My mother uh, was a social worker at the age of three. My age of three, she went back to work as a social worker in the, in the D.C. General Hospital. My father was uh, an economist working for the Commerce Department. And uh, they hired a young black domestic, right, um, to take care of me. And that was actually um, a disaster the very first moment that that happened. I mean, this woman grabbed me and force-fed me. I was a really difficult eater, and uh, um, and she was gotten rid of very quickly. And then Anna Sweetney came into my life. That's literally is her name, who was a from the Caribbean. Uh, she was Catholic and Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean. And she was like a surrogate mother to me, right? And I always tell the story, and I say this, I always tell the story as a teacher trying to explain in the 60s and 70s and 80s what segregation was like for us. I reference that sandbox story and I reference my relationship to Anna. Um, because what I say about that is that I loved Anna, she loved me. When Anna left, and I think this is true of many of us, when Anna left serving our family, being the domestic and the prepared the meals and, and cleaned the house, she disappeared into another world. You didn't it, ever ask what her world was exactly. like. Exactly. Right. And I, you know, I look back now and I tell my students, 
it never occurred to me to say, Ma, where does Anna live? Does Anna have children? Does Anna, is she married? It never occurred to me that there was any other dimension besides the dimensions of her life that served us. Um, and one of the things that I've, when I'm talking about this recently with one of my cousins, he said to me, and I think this is really important, they didn't share a lot of that or want to share a lot of that with us. That's just the way segregation and racism played out. That part of their life was none of our business. Yeah, your parents would be reliably um, described as liberal. Yes. But that liberal thought that too. Right. right, yeah, yeah. But the other thing is, and this is important, um, <clears throat> I was, it was a Jewish household, right? <clears throat> and the reference to these domestics was the Schwarzer. Blacks, right. Black which means blacks. Mm -hmm. But you never said blacks. You never said the Negro. You always said, did the Schwarzer come in today? Well, how was your day? Oh, yeah, the Schwarzer didn't come in today. And that was part of the life. And when we got political, one of our biggest demands was stop that word. You can never use that word again. And that was a big fight in our family, especially when I started working in the schools. Because what I realized when I started to teach in the schools that you'll come to, when I started teaching in the schools, one of the things that dawned on me, that all these children at this school, at Spin Garden, stay with the children of all the domestics that raised all of us. And, you know, and their lives became humanized and became full, you know, of their culture. And I, all of their, I knew nothing about black. I knew nothing about any of it, right? And when I started to change from being, from this experience, um, I demanded, we all demanded that, please don't use that word anymore around us. Don't even use that word. Well, I think we're ready to move on to the next um the next uh, part of your life. Um, you told me the other day in, a, in an interview that you really became radicalized gradually uh, by being a teacher. So oh, tell us about your experience at Spring Garden. Okay, so <clears throat> when um, I got a job teaching a very serendipitously um, I had just come out of Columbia Journalism. I was 25 years old. It was 1965. 65, okay. Uh, and I had just come out of Columbia Journalism. And um, the draft was breathing down my neck. And uh, I had gotten a deferment for a job that I was doing with the Columbia Bureau of Applied Social Research that extended my, my deferment from, uh, for being a grad student at Columbia journalism school. I was working um, doing a report on the first Vista volunteers um, uh, in Stinking Creek, Kentucky. Stinking Creek? Stinking Creek, Kentucky. So the first, it was my first introduction to the poorest Appalachia white culture. There was some black culture there, right? And I just finished writing a report about all of that and I was still 25 and I was at the top of the list to be drafted because I had all these deferments. And once those deferments are over and you're now 1A in the draft, you're immediately taken to the top of the list. And the question was, what's going to happen? Was I going to go into the military? I figured I would go into the military, not that I had no politics about the war, right? But I figured I'd go into the military. When I went into the military, I'd probably become a journalist for the military, right? And I didn't really think much about that. And, um, and um, uh, so um, my mother was really, really worried, my mother and father, but mostly my mother. And she said, Larry, there's a woman in my office whose husband uh, is involved with starting a school, and, w and he's looking for a journalism teacher. And I said to my mother, Ma, listen. I 1A in the draft, I have no teacher certification, I have no educational background, I've not been trained to do this work, there's not going to be, they're not going to be interested in me. My mother kept saying, what do you have to lose, what do you have to lose? I said, Ma, you're not listening to me. There's not going to be an interview because of my draft status, never mind, I don't have the credentials to do this job. 
And finally, I, re I relented and I said, okay, okay, I'll go to the interview. And I went to the interview, and the guy hired me right away. This is the Spingarn interview. It's a Spingarn, right. Spingarn, by the way, this, this project was part of the War on Poverty, correct? Yeah, it was one of the first Title I grants, right, to the district, because we this was the federal district, right? So this is one of the first federal grants to a local school system, right, as opposed to the local school system. And it was a dropout prevention program. These were kids... <clears throat> who are really my age and a little bit younger, I was 25, who were coming back to school after having dropped out, right? The, the, the girls, because they were y the, mostly younger, were, were, were expelled from school because they were pregnant, and some of the boys were the parents, the fathers of these children, not necessarily the father of the women they were in school with, but they were... Uh, because it was like statutory rape, because they, you know, and consent law and all that kind of stuff. So it, they could, the court system would say, if you stay in school and work and you pay some money to these women, right, you will not be charged with rape, right? And others had just dropped out to, get to work, right? So there was a huge incentive for them to come back to school, right? And they were going to do this journalism course, which never actually happened. So he's about to hire me, and I say, well, wait one second, okay? You haven't asked me about my draft status. And he said, oh, that's not going to be a problem, because once we tell them that you're working in a public school, you'll get a deferment, which was totally unknown to me. Now, it turns out a lot of men my age <clears throat> went into the... To, to education as a job, as a draft deferment, mm -hmm. until the draft laws changed, right? So there I went into this school, right, with no preparation, with no certification, with no background, and knowing nothing about the, the lives of these people that I went to go teach. Why do you think he hired you? Because he needed, a, he needed teachers, and they were looking for teachers. But I think what's really important to understand about this and I talked to a lot of my friends who were getting jobs teaching at the Cardoza Project in Urban Teaching, where I went to later. Um, you did not have to have certification or a master's degree to teach in the public schools. They were interested in bringing white men and women into the school system. This was a whole other issue, which was much more uh, clear in the Cardoza Project in Urban Teaching with all kinds of resentments that we, can, we, we, we ought to talk about, right? So I was hired to do this job. One thing is I never taught the journalism course. It never, it never happened, right? And so I got into this, to this uh, I got into the job not knowing anything at all, right? And um, the very first day I go in there and I'm, I'm really nervous, like I don't know what I'm doing. There's no preparation, there's no teacher orientation. There was no curriculum, there was nothing provided to the teachers, okay? Um, and it started to dawn on me, something is really wrong with this picture. Mind you, I went to Sidwell Friends, I went to Earlham College, I went to Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and I went to Columbia Journalism, and I went to really good places and schools. And the idea that there were these kids of color, as we would say then, for which there was nothing, for these young adults coming back to school. There weren't even books. There was no textbooks. There was nothing. And I'm going like, what is going on here? Why is this happening, right? Or why isn't this happening, right? So I was left to my wits to figure out what to do, right, with these, with this situation. And so the very first day I went to school, which was to teach, I go, what could go wrong? What could go wrong, right? Kids start, the young people start, they're really young adults, start piling into the room, very eager, very well dressed. This one young man comes in with a tweed sport jacket and a book bag over his, you know, over his yeah. backpack full of books. There's no books. And he's coming in with a whole bag full of books to look really scholarly. He sits down, he's all excited, he puts the book bag down, takes, starts taking books out and puts them on. And I'm looking at this kid and he's telling me how eager he is to be here. And the other kids are moving into their chairs. And within like two or three seconds or minutes, not even maybe a minute after he sits down, he has an epileptic seizure. He falls out of the chair 
and he starts having an epileptic seizure on the floor, right? And I knew enough not to stick my finger down his throat and all those kinds of things, right? But I just held on to him as this was... Uh, as, as he was shaking, and one of the kids ran to go get him. There was no nurse. There was nothing to help us. And some somebody came in, some adults came in, and sort of carried him out of the room, and we proceeded with the day. That's the very first moment of my teaching. And in many ways, I always thought back, when looking back on that, how me what a metaphor that was for, for where I was going to be teaching, right? What do you mean, exactly? Well, that there was so many problems that were, that were hidden problems that would suddenly reveal themselves and, and how the system was utterly unprepared. And I kept thinking, like, do you really care about these people? Is, is there no caring about who these people are? And the fact that the teachers weren't, they didn't care that we weren't prepared. They didn't care. They didn't, there was no paperwork or anything about who these young people were that were coming into our schools. And it was a dropout prevention program, so you would think that there would be these things about what, is, what are the factors with attendance and so forth. There was huge incentive for these kids because the school started at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and went till 9 o'clock at night. So they could work. During so the they day. could work during the day, okay. And, um, and their classes were, were two hours long. And I taught three classes, right, two hours long. The idea was they were doing a full year in a semester. Don't even try to begin to think about does that make any pedagogical sense. So what, what the incentive for them was, in one year they could make up two years of English or two years of history. I taught both English and history. So that was one of the incentives for them, to get a diploma and to do it in an accelerated way, right? And <clears throat> to jump to the chase, I didn't know what the hell I was going to be doing or what I was going to be teaching. I happened to read in the paper... Um, being the news media nut that I was, an article about something called SNCC and Freedom Schools. So I thought, hmm, I wonder what that's all about. It sounds like something I ought to go look into. So I went up to the SNCC office. On you better say what SNCC is. SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Let me just say, I didn't know very much about SNCC. When I was at Columbia Journalism, 64... A friend came to me and said, Larry, you want to go to a SNCC party? And I said, is that a drink or a drug, SNCC? And he laughed at me. He said, no, Larry. A SNCC is a student nonviolent coordinating committee. And it's an organization mostly of college students going down south to register blacks to vote. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean register to vote? Why don't you just vote? And I'm in graduate school. Mm -hmm. And this classmate of mine looks at me like, what kind of fucking idiot are you? Re you got to register before you vote. How do you not know about registering to vote? But you I said, I, went to to vote. I grew up in Washington, D.C. We never vote in Washington, D.C. In fact, I, was, I did, in 1964, I came back from living in Bologna, Italy, which is the second year of my... Johns Hopkins Masters in International Relations, so that I could vote for Johnson as president because I didn't want Barry Goldwater because I knew he was going to blow the world up and World War III would begin. So I rushed back to make sure I could register to vote. In the very first vote in Washington, only for president, there was no home rule. That's okay? right. So he, was, so he said, oh, you don't even know about voting? I said, no, I don't know anything about this. So You've this never is, voted. I've never voted, and I don't even know about this process, right? So I knew then when I saw the article, okay, this, I know what this is about, right? So let me go over and see what this is. So I go over to the SNCC office in Washington, mm -hmm. and Marion Barry is alone in the building. He was the director, just gotten to be the director of Washington SNCC. And I walked in, introduced myself, and said, look, I'm a teacher. I'm teaching at Spingarn Stay, and I don't have any curriculum, and I'm curious about what a freedom school is. What do you do at a freedom school? And Marion quickly said, we teach black history. And I looked at him quizzically, and I said, what's black history? And, and first of all, no one used the word black, right, Yeah. before this. I mean, I hadn't, wasn't familiar with the term. And he said, it's the history of black people. And I looked at him more quizzically, and I said, what history do black people have before white people get there? 
At which point, Marion could have said, out, in no uncertain terms, right? He said, come here, I want to show you what I'm talking about. And he brought me over to a table, and there were all these uh, booklets that were from the Freedom School curriculum packets. And I started looking at these things, and none of which history did I know anything about. None of it, right? And um, about slave rebellions, about black, you know, um, aspirations, about slavery, none of which did I know anything about, right? So I'm going like, oh my God. So I started bringing these things to my curriculum, to my students, right? Who were like, why are you telling us all this, Mr. White Guy, right? And I said, because I didn't know anything about this. And so what started to... And then Marion <coughs> was like my mentor. <coughs> Excuse me. Marion became my mentor. Because as I was explaining to him, the neglect of this school and the conditions of this school, Marion started saying, Larry, you have to understand, we're living in a colonial plantation system here. I'm going like, What? I never thought of my hometown as a plantation colonial system. And he started making all these analogies about what this is all about and why these conditions exist. And I'm going like, oh. And all of a sudden, I'm getting my consciousness raised. And I'm learning all about this. And then I'm going to teach this to the students. And they're starting to tell me about their lives and how they live, which was totally, uh, totally new information for me to take in, right? And I started realizing these are the sons and daughters of the women that have been working for my family forever and the women that I would ride on the bus with, the domestics I would ride on the bus coming home from Sidwell Friends to go up to my house and on, in, in the Brightwood community of Northwest Washington, right? And it all started to come together to me that there was this whole other world, right, that I started to know so the point, one of the points that became clear to me is that when I started meeting other radicals who are a little bit younger than I was, because like they were the college SNCC students, people, like, the, like the SNCC people, I'm yeah. talking mostly white, Yeah. Okay? okay, they had come to their politics, it seemed to me, from, from, ac from academic study. College. From college, from academic study in college, right? And they were reading maybe, and it was a little risky, like C. Wright Mills mm -hmm. or William Appleton Williams or some of these more radical people because it couldn't get too Marxist or too communist-like because you could, faculty could get red-baited, right? So, and it wasn't stone Marxist, hardcore Marxist, but they were starting to question American foreign policy, American race policy, uh, equal rights and all of that from the study, right? I, with master's degrees in journalism and international relations, a major in literature and a minor in history and gov American history and government, was utterly clueless about anything of this history, right? That's the way it's supposed to be. I mean, what we later learn is that's called the Dunning School of History. I don't know if you know what the Dunning School of... No. He was a professor, I always forget if it's at Harvard history professor at Harvard or, or, or uh, Columbia. Um, the Dunning School was a history that taught us, and I clearly remember being taught this, that Reconstruction was the biggest mistake in American history. Giving illiterate black people power was a disaster. It would, what, what happened during Reconstruction was a colossal social mistake of social engineering they were ill-equipped, they were incompetent, they were illiterate, they were, uh, they were, uh, uh, um, they were, uh, I'm lost for the word right now, they were uh, corrupt, they were uh, sexual predators, all of the things that we started to, they were demonized, they were dehumanized, they were vilified, right, and it was a big, huge mistake. Mm -hmm. And thank God there was restoration and redemption in the South. And Jim Crow. And Jim Crow, okay. And, you know, settled everything down, stabilized everything. That's the way, that's the, way the world's supposed to be, right? And that's how we were raised. So when Marion says to me, it's the history of black people, I say to him, what history do black people have before white people get there? Give them history, right? right? So I'm starting to learn the power of this narrative and these alternative narratives. And, I, and then the students are starting to tell me the narratives of their lives. 
They never even thought about the narrative of their lives. We're all awakening each other, one to the other, right? And I had this sense, and then I started doing a lot of things with SNCC that, with Mary in that first year. There were two Talk things. Talk about that, the SNCC people. There that were you know, two things right. that were happening that year. One was there was a series of police shootings, hello, mm -hmm. of young black kids fleeing shop, accused, accusations of shoplifting. They were running out of stores and they were being shot by police. Now the police were all white because the city had no home rule. There were the two, the, the House and the Senate district committees and there were three commissioners running the city at the time appointed by these committees, one of which was a civil engineering person to manage the city. But they were dominated by Southern avowed segregationist lawmakers in Congress. And most of the jobs in the city, except for school teachers in the black schools, were to Southern white, for the police, for the fire, for all those jobs, right? So that only reinforced the Jim Crow quality of the city. And so when these police officers were chasing down these kids supposedly accused of shoplifting, running away, you know, it was, it was, and shooting them. So we started to, SNCC was starting to address this issue. This was in 1966 or so, right? Yeah, yeah. 60, 65, 66, those things were starting yeah. to happen. The other thing that happened was, was the whole thing about D.C. Transit and Roy Chalk yeah, look. and the one-day boycott of the D.C. Transit company. Roy Chalk was a New Yorker who owned the privatized bus system in Which Washington. Which is the only public transportation. Which is the only Washington public transportation buses, right? that that bust the domestics. This is a little twist on the on the on the Montgomery school school uh, uh, Montgomery bus, bus boycott. boycott right. But it was the same issue of and and the, what they were about to do was raise the fare twenty five cents five cents right. from twenty to twenty five cents. And that was a big leap, right? And it was, SNCC grabbed that issue and said, this is, this is racism. This is, there's no need economically for this. Chalk is a, you know, is a privatized business and he's, this is for his profit. And it's a huge burden on these people. So they organized, we, SNCC organized a one-day boycott, which was well-planned, right? And uh, in which we would, um, provide transportation, the city started to be mobilized, the more progressives in the city started to be mobilized. My kids got involved with this, I got involved with this, we were providing alternative transportation, right, for these things. So these became the discussion in the classroom. The activism that we were in, involved in became part of the curriculum of the classroom. The black history that SNCC was providing became part of the history of the classroom. And what was your first curriculum? Then? It was my really? first curriculum. And I was inventing it as I was going along, right? There was nobody in the D.C. department was saying of schools, the hell are you doing? What the hell? Who? No one, the, it was all, I had total freedom. Mm -hmm. And I could do whatever I wanted to, I had full discretion by default. And this was also part of the problem, right? Now, this school also failed, the, there were all these pregnant mothers, young mothers, you know, unwed mothers in the school. Uh, there was no nurse in the school. There was no fire drill in the school. There were no books in the school. Were you still at Spin Garden? If this is all at Spin Garden. No yeah. paper in the school, right? And, you know, and I'm starting to go like, yo, this is profound, and I'm starting to understand through Marion and through SNCC what, what the, exactly the racism and the inequality this is not Sidwell Friends School for sure. Mm. You know, this is not the white schools of the Northwest Washington for sure. I never had any sense that this was going on, right? It was, and I, it, it was clearly outrageous to me, right? And so at one point, a group of myself and two or three teachers went to somebody in the upper echelons of the school department, right, to discreetly say, look, do we have some serious questions about what's going on in this project? And we're really concerned. We do not want to, we're not here to, to condemn the school. We want somebody to help us fix this and correct this. And these uh, administrators yelled and screamed at us. 
how dare we come to them with this kind of issue? How dare we even, and if we were to ever leave there, and we ever went and reported all of this, right, we would be summarily dismissed. We would never be able to teach ever again. And we walked out of there like, whoa, this is really institutional problem here. I mean, they really, you have no right to go above your supervisor, your, you know, your, your principal and report all this, right? It got worse, right? Because the director of this project, who was black, the whole, most of the staff was black. I don't remember if there were, how many other white teachers there were at Spingarn. But at one point, it was becoming clear that this man was getting involved with the female students in the school to such a degree that on one day, these two young women, probably my age, mid-twenties, in the school, <clears throat> grabbed his keys, grabbed his paycheck, jumped in his car, and were driving around the block, honking the horn, waving his paycheck, right? That's how bad it got, right? What was the point they were trying to make? Like, look what we got, and look who this principal is. I mean, they was just, who knows what the point was. Yeah. I mean, it was just to embarrass him, to shame him. It was the whole thing was, and I remember looking out the window, and the kids were looking out the window, we were going like, whoa, what is going on here? So, I don't even know that we told that. So here's the next part of this experience, right? Now, bear with me for a second, because... Uh, one of the kids that I grew up with, Jimmy Chapman, his father was Oscar Chapman. Oscar Chapman was the, at one point, Truman's Secretary of Interior. But Oscar Chapman was more than that. He was the chief lobbyist for Dominican and Cuban sugar. Right, so for all the legislation that was bringing in sugar from the Caribbean, he was in charge of, in the Democratic Party. God only knows what that was all about, right? He was very close to Truman, right? And uh, Mr. Chapman was, very was really good friends with Senator Greening of Alaska, who was one with Fulbright, one of the two senators that refused to vote for the Bay of Tonkin resolution. Yeah, right. He had a grandson that was our age that was coming to Washington to go to, to, go to, to one of the, I think, to Georgetown Law, right? Yeah. And he asked, knowing Jimmy, Oscar's son, if he would invite some of his friends to come meet the grandson. And we all had dinner over at Greening's house. And I'm going like, oh my God, you know, the revered senator, right? We're having dinner at his house. So he, as we sat down at the table, he asked us to go around the room and to introduce ourselves to his grandson. When it came to me, I said I was a teacher and I was uh, teaching at this program, right? And I started to talk a little bit about the program. And I said, what a wonderful program this was, but it had problems. And Greening leans in and he says, what do you mean it has problems? Tell me about this, right? And this is after we had been scolded to never tell the story, right? Mm -hmm. And I started to tell him, and I said, I don't know that I should tell you this. He said, well, I'm on the district committee, or I, I can't remember if he was on the committee, he had friends on the committee. I have to look that up. But he said, I'm really interested in this, I want to know more about this, right? So I started to tell him all the problems we were having, and I kept saying to him, Listen, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to destroy this program. I want to fix it. He said, That's exactly what we want to do in the district committee. We want to know about this problem. This is a serious problem. We want to fix it before it gets really bad, right? And then I happened to mention the fact that my cousin was Frank Mankiewicz, yes. who was Bobby Kennedy's press secretary, and he he said, I want you to write me a memo. And I want you to describe everything that you're telling me. And I said, he said, I promise you this will not be leaked, this will not be made public, but we want to be informed about this because this is federal money going to a project like this, and I want to make sure that we get ahead, get ahead of this kind of a thing. And so I wrote this whole letter up, and I cc'd it to the new replacement of the gentleman that was you know, caught in that scandal, mm -hmm. He freaked out, and he said, this is not my problem. And I said, I know it's not your problem. He was really upset. Why are you writing a letter to these prominent people, right? And I said, because I was asked to do this, I explained the circumstances. I promised them what was going to happen. This is not my fault. This is not my fault. 
I said, I know that, and I hope maybe we can get this, maybe this is a way we can do something about this, right? So in a sense, here I am using some of my privilege and my white skin privilege and my power to try to do, it's not even understanding the dynamic that I'm involved in, and also I'm a native Washingtonian who has all these connections, right? Yes. And all of this is starting to unfold, right? And then uh, things quiet down a little bit, and I'm still going back and forth to SNCC and working with students. And then the new director comes to me and says, uh, Larry, I, would, I want to ask you a favor. I want you to pick a student to give the salutatorian. You just who pick one of your top students to give, because we're going to have a commencement. We're going to invite a lot of dignitaries for the graduating class in this pioneering program, right? So I went to the class and I said to them what the problem, you know, does anybody want to really do this? Do you think you can do this? Do you think we ought to do this? And this one young man jumped up and he said, I want to do this. And what I remember about this young man was he was older than I. So um, we're back to the, back to the ceremony. Um, and uh, so I, this young man I started to describe said, I'll do it. And he uh, was a very impressive kid. In, in, older than I, uh -huh. in his mid twenties, a little, little older, he had his own business, of, like an ice cream truck. Uh, dropped out of school and started this business, and he was—he really didn't. He wanted the certificate. He just wanted to have a high school diploma. Yeah. And he was so grateful to have this opportunity to come back to the school, and it worked so that he could do his business and he could do the school. And he said, "I would like to tell my story." And but but he like I he said um, he said you know there really are problems that I would like to address and I said well you could address those things you don't have to name names and if you you and be specific and talk about why you're so grateful to this program so he puts together the, his speech and his words and I look it over and I make sure that it's you know okay and appropriate as I thought at the time it would be. And we come to the graduation ceremony in the auditorium spin garden. It's in the evening, and there's some school officials, and there's some local pol Well, there was no home rule, but there was, you know, dignitaries there. And he gets up to give this speech that's critical of the school, right? And there's this tepid applaud afterwards. First of all, it was a big, huge mistake for me to do this. Because, why was it a mistake? Because a high school diploma is a major ritual in a black community, especially, because it's so many rights are being offered and so many opportunities are being offered. Mm -hmm. To criticize the program mm -hmm. is to question the integrity and the value of this experience, right? He'd said all the things he needed to say about what an enormous advantage was and what he learned and how grateful he was to all the teachers, but he did say the program didn't have nurses, it didn't have fire drills, it didn't have books, etc. And when, what I do remember about this experience at this point is that when everybody was walking out of the auditorium, uh, the principal, the director of the school, Major William Rumsey, these, these black administrators were in the National Guard and they kept their military titles. And he ran off, he jumped off this, literally jumped off the stage and ran up to me. And he started saying, Aronson, you wrote that goddamn speech. Mm -hmm. You wrote that. I said, no, I didn't, sir. No, I didn't. I approved it. Right, but that's all. He said, no, that's all stuff that you said in that letter. Mm -hmm. I said, all the stuff I said in the letter were the things that the students said to me were the problem. You know, he looked at me and he said, Aronson, no one fucks with Major Rumsey. Major Rumsey is a major in this man's army. You have fucked with Major Rumsey. You will never, ever again teach in any school, never mind in the District of Columbia. You're done. You hear me? And he walked out, right? Meanwhile, I had already started to apply to the Cardoza Project in urban <laughs> teaching because I had made a decision that I wasn't going to be a journalist I was going to become a teacher. I was getting so involved in that one year that I wanted to go to the Cardoza Project in Urban Teaching where I would get credentialed. 
Yes. And it became a, a question. Now, the next thing that happened was this young man was denied his diploma as a result of this speech. Mm. And when that happened, he called me up and he said, Larry, he was really upset. He called me and he said, Larry, Rumsey wouldn't give me the, my diploma. I said, really? He said, yeah. Can he do that? I said, no, he can't do that. So I got on the phone. I called up my reporter friends at the Post and at the Star. And I told them the whole story. And they interviewed this kid. That report came out. It, this is before Internet and all of that. It came out. The first edition of the Post was on the newsstand at 11 p.m. the night before. Right? At 5 a.m., that young man got a call from the school department, such as it was, to come down to the school department and pick up his diploma. Who wrote the article? Uh, Jay Matthews, maybe? Jay Ma the education guy. Yeah, still that's there. one of the people I... Is he? Yeah. Oh, I have got to go talk to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he's one of the people I need to go talk to. So Jay, who I got to know because of my connections from Columbia Journalism, right? And, and I had told him, and I said, I don't want to go public with this story. Before things were happening, before this all happened, I said, "Jay, now I got a story for you, right?" And so I told him the story, right? And he reported it, right? So this became a problem as to whether I was going to actually get a job, at, you know, I was going to be allowed. And the Cardoza Project in Urban Teaching is a whole nother, is what was became the most. It, the Cardoza Project in Urban Teaching, and I've been teaching for forty years, and I ended up later years later at Harvard Graduate School of education at the Institute for po so Social Policy and, uh, yes, the Institute for Social Policy, that's was called something more than that. But I want to say first and foremost about the Cardoza Project, as someone who had later gotten into a doctoral program at Harvard, the quintessential ed school program, you know, teacher training, and, and this was actually not teacher training, this was education and social policy. <clears throat> it, it, this was preparing people for more managerial, administrative, you know, and history of education. That program that I was in at the Cardoza Project, and I was just talking this over with some friends of mine who were in the program two nights ago, was one of the most incredible, probably the most incredible teacher training, teacher certification program that I have know anything about and never heard about, right? This program was about empowering teachers, empowering students, being involved in the community, learning about the community that you're teaching, and it was also about the power, eschew the history books, eschew the textbooks, and create curriculum. Mm -hmm. All of which I was starting to do at Spingarn Stay, on my own figuring out curriculum is important, what you teach is important. It must be relevant to what these kids' lives are. Now at the Cardoza Project, they are giving us a framework, right? And there were three major books that we read. One was Jerome uh, Bruner's book on the called the. Uh, it was he was a he was a uh, cognitive psychologist, and it was Benjamin Bloom's called Bloom's Taxonomy. These were all about breaking down cognition. And the third one was um, Eric Foner. And they were all sort of, they were all, not sort of, they were progressive educators, theorists, right, that were saying that all of the curriculum that we've been putting in textbooks is utterly irrelevant and, uh, and disconnected to the lives of these students. No wonder they're not learning anything. Right. And here I was sort of coming to sort of similar conclusions in this project on my own that the curriculum ought to be their lives and what is happening in our community and making sense of it. And that's what schools should be. And I mean, we, later we talked about consciousness raising. And, but in this school at the Cardoza Project, it was also about how do you frame curriculum and it was also about the power of dialogue with students and how do you ask questions and how do you phrase questions. And it also told us, taught us how to organize lesson planning for these curriculum projects. And, and, to, and to, so we had the framework and the structure and the importance of, of pedagogy and pedagogical principles 
that were liberating. I mean, later when I got to Harvard, I was introduced to Paolo Ferreri, and basically liberation pedagogy is what we were developing. In talking to some of my friends from this project... Excuse me, I want to stop for a second. Could you describe what liter, li, liberating, the phrase you just, what, is, yeah. what that means in layman's terms? Yes. Liberate. So, um, Paulo Ferreri was a, a Brazilian, uh, he, he, he taught literacy. Mm -hmm. um, he did it a lot with through the UN. And he, he talked about conscientization. He created a lot of very, a lot of new words, right? But he talked about uh, the reason why uh, most uh, colonialized people uh, in, in Brazil, Portuguese colonialized or Spanish colonialized or French or English colonialized, never have literacy is because their world is not being described to them. Their languages, their indigenous language is not the language that's being used in the school to describe the word and the vocabulary. And so uh, liberation pedagogy is teaching and pedagogy that in fact liberates your voice. Finding your voice and telling your story. Making sense of your world. At the, at the, at the Cardoza Project, we were learning what, really what was called inquiry-based learning, inductive reasoning. Most of what was taught and the approach to most teaching was didactic and deductive. It was basically presenting students with factoids and for them to regurgitate. The history, the chronology, the famous people. It was the history of exceptionalism of America. <clears throat> Memorize it. It's not your history. It's our history. It's, it's the history... <clears throat> excuse me. It's the history of... It's triumphalism mm -hmm. yeah. over you and your people, okay? So what was happening with my education at SNCC, right, uh, was that, wait a minute, there's other narratives here that need to be taught yeah. and to connect with these and this relevant. What I was learning at the Cardoza Project and Urban Teaching was ways to structure cognition and learning and skills and knowledge thinking skills, and inquiry, but the thrust of this was learning to ask questions, learning how to distinguish fact from opinion, learning how to detect bias, learning how to discern point of view, learning how to make an hypothesis and then to test an hypothesis, learning about inference, learning about conclusions, learning about seeing patterns, this is Bloom, about making summary. So, so it was teaching uh, especially in history, right? And what I quickly did come to believe, right, was in a democracy that requires that requires uh, <clears throat> the citizen to be informed and literate. All of this was being denied. These people of color, their their understanding was absent. Their their understanding was part of the pro was part of the intention of the system. It was part of the to obfuscate uh, 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 the story of their lives and to denigrate the story of their lives, dehumanize the story of their lives. This is not relevant, right? And this is to come reverse that whole thing and to question authority, but not just scream the loudest and the nastiest, but to do it with, 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 with protocols of history. We were teaching the students to think like historians think. Mm -hmm. We were teaching them to, in writing and reading, to think and read and write like poets and writers and editors learn to use language. We were empowering them with these skills. That's liberation pedagogy, right? This was a whole new, very progressive idea, right? And it, it, it came to me to understand that public education, that the public schools were the citadel of our democracy. Social studies, in particular, was the crucible. Mm -hmm. Where you mix the story, the demography of the class, the, 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 the political situation of the children, so of the young people, they were not children, they were young people. They are learning, this is where you learn to make sense of, of your situation. 
that you learn that you are writing the narrative of your lives. You are writing the history. Right? And to learn the power of narrative in your life. Find your voice and tell your story. So the next couple of years through the Cardoza Project, I started teaching. There are two really interesting curriculum stories I want to share. Mm -hmm. The first thing that we did the very first year that I was there is we came up with this curriculum called Who Killed President Kennedy? Okay. Now, the Warren Commission had just come out. 64. It's 64. So this was 65, right? And there were all these stories, conspir conspiracy theories floating around. So here was an example of to teach young people how to use inductive thinking, like, like empiricism, like the scientific method of looking for facts, corroborating facts, and putting together the truth of the historical matter. And we thought, this is a perfect example, right? So we developed this, this is an introductory curriculum. Who killed JFK, right? And, you know, he was revered amongst the people in the classroom yeah. and their families. And this was like, this is real. And let's use all these things that we're learning how to evaluate the Warren Commission, right? And all the problems of the Warren Commission, right? Well, I'll never forget this. We presented, we introduced the curriculum. Again, this is the very opening weeks of school. The kids looked at us and they go like, the hell's the problem? Everybody knows who killed the president. Johnson killed the president. He was the vice president. Now he's the president. We went like, whoa, which made total sense yeah. in their world, yeah. right? There's no mystery to this. So we flipped it and we said, can you prove that? Is there any evidence that shows anything about Johnson's complicity? So we made them sort of look at this and use this. It became much more problematic to try to do, because we were trying to demonstrate how you use inductive reasoning and thinking skills to do inquiry you know, and, and be able to prove your point and, you know, justify your point and with the evidence and the material evidence and build the whole thing. What I, we pulled away from that curriculum was, and really caught, made us rethink all this, was the fact that the kids, we wanted to teach them that there's no such a thing as absolute truth, especially the absolute truths that are in the, yeah. the exceptional narrative, right? But, and there's objective truth and subjective truth, and how do you balance these two things? Never mind the whole question about, about ideological bent and rhetorical in the classroom, like where is the line to be drawn, you know, to, to raising students' consciousness, and, you know, and the whole question about teachers, your, your politics. You're not trying, you know, you're not trying to, to, uh, to, to, to indoctrinate them. You're trying to get them to question quite the opposite. Here's a doctrine, question it, examine it, throw questions back at me as the teacher. So this thing, this project did two things. It reinforced their skepticism about official documents, mm -hmm. and it also, we thought, fed their cynicism. You can't believe anything these people tell you, which they were more cynical about this, these young people of color, than we ever were. Yeah. We, we ever became right, as the, as the war progressed. The next curriculum project that we tried to do, which was even more interesting and more telling, okay, we're teaching American history, right, so what we tried to do was, the kids were coming to us, there's a whole other thing about I was working at Upward Bound and I got to know these kids really well. In the summer, at, at, you know, at Upward Bound was a program for disadvantaged youth who teachers said had potential but weren't being reached in the regular school program, put them on a college campus. It was the opposite end of Head Start, and this was a pioneering year. There were five first projects. One of those projects was at College Park, Maryland, University of Maryland. All the kids uh, from the district who were, were black, they went there, right? There are no white kids. The white kids in the project, because it was a federal project, came from East Baltimore and some black kids from East Baltimore together on the campus. That is a whole other story to talk about. But those black kids that were in the summer um, at Cardoza that I was living with literally on the dorm became my students when I came to Cardoza, right? So we already had that relationship, right? So 
the kids are starting to raise questions in the school. This is the second year, like 66, 67. They're starting to raise consciousness, uh, questions about, we, they wanted to, they were starting to get a little bit into uh, African fashion, right? Letting their hair grow. When I first started teaching, right, black men, young men, shave their head real close. If you let your hair grow out, you're a Bama, meaning you look like your country, mm -hmm. right? That you, you're, you know, this is not what you're supposed to, you're not, this is not, sophisticated, right? And you don't wear anything from Africa because, yeah. you know, we were apes and monkeys. I mean, they were internalizing this whole horrible depiction of, you know, of, of what Africa was, right? All of a sudden, these things were starting to reverse because of the movement, because of SNCC, you know, in particular, right? So they wanted to wear dashikis. They wanted to be fashionable. They wanted to have... Uh, school said, no. The school, the official position of the school, all black administrators was... That's a signature of, mili of militancy. Yeah. The dashiki. And the other thing that was happening was some of the girls were wearing kimonas, uh -huh. you know, that, that without a waist or anything, you know what I'm mm -hmm. talking about? And the suspicion was they were hiding pregnancy. So the, the vice principal was a woman. She would literally run up, and the dress could not, the dress must be below the knee. She would walk around the school literally with a, a seamstress's yardstick and to make sure, to measure these, stop these girls in the hall, and if the dress was a little too high, the head was a little too high, send them home, and if the, she pushed their stomach in to make sure they weren't hiding pregnancy. So there were all these dress codes. The kids also were starting to talk about a black student union or something, a student government, and they were complaining about this, right? And so we said, well, let's, let's look at the American Revolution and the Sons of Liberty and the Patriots. What would they have done when they were making plain complaints and their grievances. So they started coming up with all these examples of what they would do, you know, just to make the comparison and make relevant, right? And then one day, they took our words to heart, right? And they came to the school, Cardoza, and they posted up on the school door as you walked in and several different places in the main corridor on the first floor, a set of demands. And the demands were to change the dress code and all of these other complaints that they had, right? They were ripped down immediately. And a meeting was called of the student government, such as it was, the captain of the athletic teams, the cheerleaders, who knew nothing about this. But they were sympathetic with it. And the administration told them, listen, we can't do anything about this. And these are the rules, and we can't change the rules. They walked out of the meeting with the administration, all black administration, all black students. And somehow or other, it, they went down to the cafeteria and it got completely out of control and it ended up in a food fight. Now, I was not in school that day because I was working on yet another project, curriculum project, with my director, Larry Cuban, who I, there's a whole lot to talk about him. Uh, uh, and I was, this was a curriculum about, uh, called You've Been Arrested, and it was about the uh, emerging uh, criminal rights laws and the changes, the, right. the Gideon case, the Escobedo case, the Miranda case. So all of the due process issues around getting arrested and how that develops and all that. I was running this curriculum at home. It took the day off because I had a deadline. And one of my colleagues called and said, Larry, you better get up here. All hell is breaking loose at the school, right? And I had no idea what he was talking about. So I lived around the, around the corner from Cardoza. I come walking in, right? I get there about 11 o'clock, 11.30, sometime when all this rioting is now starting to happen. I walk into the main office and the secretary says, where were you, Mr. Aronson, thinking this is my, these are my students? I'm clueless what is happening, right? I walk in and they say, where were you been all morning? I said, I was across the street on the roof with my binoculars and my walkie-talkie directing this whole thing, right? You said being, that? Yeah, being really silly. And they were really angry at me because what an <laughs> arrogant, stupid thing to say, right? And so then I walk, I mean, I, I keep saying as I'm, I'm writing my memoirs about all this, right? And I'm reflecting on what I did and didn't understand about what the hell I was doing and how naive I was and how a lot of the indiscretion and, and a lot of the miscalculations and misjudgments that I was making and learning. So I walk, now they brought all the kids into the auditorium. And as I go to the auditorium, 
the administrators, some of the administrators up on the, I'm going like this on the stage, and the kids are blah, 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 making all kinds of noise, right? And it's sort of get, getting full of themselves that they've sort of taken control of the building. They've also called the press, they've called the newspapers, and they've called the radios and the TV, right? And so now this black school in a riot situation. I walk into Mr. Evans, who was the principal, very light-skinned man, very moderate, very... He walked up to me and said, Mr. Evans, I need your help. I really need your help. And I'm looking around going, like, what am I supposed to do? He said, please go up there and say something. Try to calm the, everybody's down, right? So I go up on the stage, and I get up on the stage, and everyone's going, Larry, Larry! Because everybody called me Larry, right, instead of Mr. Aronson. Mm -hmm. And so... <laughs> And I go like, now's the time to talk! And the kids go, fuck you! We've been talking for 400 years! You taught us not to do this anymore! I go, look, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. But you've made your demands, and you've got the press here, right? They now know there's a real issue. Now is that you have leverage. Go sit down, make ask for a meeting, and see if you can negotiate some of these. And that's what they did. Wow. That's what they did. Meanwhile, there's a picture of me in the midst of all of this. But these were sort of the things that were starting to happen, right? I have a question for you before yeah. you go further. Um, how long did the Cardoza project last, and who? Funded it and created Okay, yes. It. The Cardoza Project yeah. is really important. It started with uh, two black educator women, Vanetta Washington. I'm right now forgetting the other person. It was an idea of doing teacher training certification. Mm -hmm. The idea was to bring young Peace Corps and VISTA volunteers mm -hmm. into the public school system to cert pay them bookies, but pay them some money while they're going to school. And in one year of teacher certification, they would get a master's degree and certification from Howard University. Now, at that school of Cardoza, where this was, there were black teachers that had been there forever and ever. In my mind, I, I really felt, in my racist mind at the time, that the reason why these schools had failed these children was not only because of the curriculum, these black teachers didn't know the curriculum. They didn't know how to do what we were learning how to do. Right? Let me just cut to the chase to say, in the faculty of Cardoza, was a, was a woman who had been a veteran teacher by the name of Florence Law. Florence Law was the great niece or great granddaughter, maybe great great, I don't know how many generations, of a black Reconstruction congressman. Mm -hmm. Charles Drew, who separated blood plasma so that we could have blood plasma for people in accident, died from a car accident in the South because they wouldn't give him white blood. Mm -hmm. His brother was the chemistry teacher in the high school. There were three or four Tuskegee Airmen in the high school teaching, right? These were black teachers who, who were the lived experience, who were teaching the students. And very, and very um, experienced. And right? very experienced. Like, and and somehow or other, I got to quickly figure that out. Don't ask me how. But I started to, to get to know them, and they came in really respectful to me. And, you know, there was all of that happening in terms of, of my activism, and they're being really resentful at first, like, who the hell are you all to come in here, right? Let me say one other thing that's really important to this whole story. Within the first two or three weeks of my teaching at Cardoza, I'm leaving the building around four in the afternoon, I'm probably from leaving my room from planning classes and lessons, and it's quiet in the main lobby of the Cardoza. This young kid comes up to me, who I did not know, was not a student of mine. And he came up to me and he said, Yo, teacher, I want to talk to you. I I'm fictionalizing somewhat. I don't remember the exact words of exchange. But the thrust of it was, Listen, you're just like all these other white teachers that come in here that tr think they know everything and think they know what we should know and what we should teach, what we should be taught. And you reject all the things that have come before you. And you come in here and you take all these notes and then you write a book and then you go off and you become famous and you become rich and you leave. And nothing changes here. You want to really help out? The best thing for you to do was leave here. Now that was not a threat to me. I mean, he was not threatening me. He was being very direct with me. And it occurred to me 
And I turned to him and I said, this is really important because I just come from Columbia Journalism a year before. And that was my plan. Okay, I'm going to teach one or two more years. And then I'll become a journalist. I'll become the next Jonathan Kozol, the next John Holt. You know, I'll become Nat Hentoff. I'll become the next writer of all this from the experience. And I turned to this young man and I said, I hear you. And I swear to God to you, I swear to God, I will not do what you just accused me of thinking that I was going to do. I promise you, I never will do it. I'm here to do the work. And he left. And he said, well, I hope, I, I hope you do that. And over all the years, until right now, when I would tell what became known as Larry stories about what I was teaching and all the things that were happening, back then, um, uh, people would say, Larry, you got to write this up. you got to write an article. you got to write a book. And my re reply to them, and I meant this, it was a real conflict for me, was, I am not there to write the book. I am there to do the work. Right? I wanted to write the book, but I just felt more and more it was not the legitimate and proper thing to do. I want to say something else about this journalism aspect of all this. And I think this is very important. This is Washington, D.C., and I'm coming from Columbia Journalism. So it turns out I have friends from Columbia Journalism who are working at the Washington Post, the Washington Star. My roommate, the very first year I was teaching at Spingard, was Peter Osnos, mm -hmm. who was working for I.F. Stone, Izzy Stone's mm -hmm. Weekly, right? Mm -hmm. I was going, my other very close friend, Dave Sanford, later became the editor of page one of the Wall Street Journal, was a cub reporter or whatever you would call him. He was Jimmy Ridgway's assistant, right? And I got to go over there and watch the New Republic put together their stories and got to know Andy Kopkine and Jimmy Ridgway and a weird, paranoid, freaky guy called Ralph Nader mm -hmm. uh, who was writing a book about unsafe at any speed. So I was around these progressive and radical reporters who were trying to get to the real story. And I was there with this education training as a journalist, living the story, and they kept saying, Larry, give us stories, give us stories, or tell us about what's happening. Meanwhile, they're teaching me and telling me, as they're doing the story of the movement, about, you know, what is happening in the movement. And what I'm, what I'm trying to establish here is that, it is the contextualized my radicalization. Not only am I in this teaching, and not only am I at the Cardoza Project, I'm teaching, Cardoza Project and Urban Teaching that's giving me a framework and sort of pedagogical understanding of what the hell I'm doing and reinforcing what I'm doing and legitimize what I'm doing. I'm surrounded by, I'm surrounding myself with all these radical reporters and, and less radical than radi activists, and and radical, radical act activists, activists who are doing right. the things. Because I'm also going to the Institute for Policy Studies. Yeah. And at the Institute for Policy Studies, I'm in these seminars and these discussions with SNCC leaders like Stokely Carmichael and like Ivanhoe Donaldson and right. H. Rap Brown right. and Charlie Cobb and all these other people coming up to visit. And uh, I should mention some women's name that I can't think of right now. Cynthia. Yeah. Nash. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Diane Nash Diane is who Nash. I was thinking of. Yeah. Cynthia uh, Washington. Yes. And also... Uh, Sue Oren and all these other people, we're all, Betty. and we're starting to organize Betty. in this city. I mean, Betty Garman, I haven't even talked about we organizing around, around racism, and I'm joining SNCC, and I'm joining larger organizations. While I'm teaching and I'm becoming an activist, and this line between my classroom work and my organizing work is really getting really strange and new, and, and I'm pushing the envelope and pushing the envelope, right? So all of this context is really very transformative about who I am and what I'm doing. And I keep talking about the serendipity of all of this because the fact that I'm here in the city and there's the Institute for Policy Studies and there's the New Republic that later becomes the, these guys all leave. That's a whole other story to the nation and my friends at the Post and the, and the Star. And so I'm surrounded by all of this and I'm becoming more and more conscious about what the real story is and I'm trying to figure out what the real story is. So there are two other things that I think are really important to talk about in, in relation to this. One is, um, well, one is is that uh, is that two of my students become Stokely Carmichael's bodyguards, 
and they're getting and and my and and also I was I was turning my kids on to Malcolm X's autobiography, Claude Brown's Man Child in the Promised Land, and I was talking to black literature that I was getting to know. So they're getting to learn all this literature and making sense out of it, and they're starting to get politicized. Paul becomes one of the big activists in SNCC. Several of my students become active, right to the point that they're Stokely's bodyguard. Paul is a, a story unto himself, who was a black belt, who was a kid that I met first in Upward Bound, and who was really angry and raged, and somehow that we connected, and he sort of trusted me, and I was a calming effect on him. And one day he comes up to me and he says, Larry, uh, what are you doing after school? And I said, I'm working on preparing lessons. And went, Can you give us a ride to Mary McKeeba's house? I said, to Mary McKeeba's house? Why are we going to Mary McKeeba's house? Because Stokely's living with Mary McKeeba. Right. So I go, oh, yeah, I'm curious. Now you can't come in. This is You can't come into the house. But would you give us, oh, yeah, I'll give you a ride. <laughs> so we start driving up 16th Street and the kids are like, talking to me. They said, Larry, see that car right behind us? That's the F that's our FBI tag. I get, you know, I go like bullshit. They said, no, no, that's it. Take a right. I take a right. The car follows me. Take a left, et cetera, et cetera. And so I realized now I got a, a FBI tag, right? And I'm being followed. God only knows where, where all that was going, right? But the but we all had this plan. We were getting more and more political and more and more right, you know, radicalized and it's come the revolution and all of this, right? I want to say something. Those were also the days that everybody who was political we were becoming frenzied because of the, the war, essentially, exactly. was driving people crazy. And so everything seemed to lead to something else. There was people on, on the edge. Everybody. A word I hate, intersectionality. Yeah. But yeah. boy, but it was, it was all over the place. It yeah. was all over the place. And there were the anti... I mean, we talked about the, the, the demonstrations against the war and all of that. Uh, and it was the Panthers coming in. And the out. Panthers coming in. Yeah. And, you know, my cousin David Levy, whose house we're in right now, may he rest in peace, was the Panther lawyer. Yeah. And he was Marion's lawyer. Yeah. And, 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 and SNCC, DC SNCC, is morphing in from pride yeah. around the question of police and jobs is morphing into free DC. Right. And it's becoming, this is the voter registration, just like in the South. So all of this is all happening, right? Yes. Yeah. I want one day in April the 4th or whatever that fatal day was to the movies for some silly oh, reason. Yeah. I come home and I'm living at 15th and Euclid and there's a lot of noise in my neighborhood, right? And there's a Howard dorm, a graduate school dorm on Euclid Street. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I said, boy, they're making a lot of noise. It's a little early for graduation ceremony kind of stuff, partying. I, the phone rings and I get into the house. Larry, where are you? Now, this no cell phones. Okay, what do you mean, where am I? I'm at home. You're calling me, right? Larry, don't go outside. Do me a favor. Do us a favor. Call up Bill Simon, head of the teachers' union, right, who I'd gotten to know, you know, because the, the union was just Post. getting organized. The Washington Post you're talking about? No. no what? The teachers' union. Oh, the teachers' union. Oh, I'm sorry. Charlie right. Chang, right? Okay, Charlie, okay. And uh, Bill Simon, yeah, socialists. Okay. Yeah. Forming the teachers' union. Yes, I remember. That was a whole other thing. They organized me, right? We don't need we don't need unions. Yes, we do. So that was a whole other politicalization, not just organizing, not just AFL CIO. These were socialists mm -hmm. organizing the teachers' union. Right? Call Bill Simon up. I said, "Why am I calling Bill Simon up? This is a kid, a student, because we want to shut down the schools." I go, "What, Larry? Because Doctor he." he the king is, what's what I heard over the phone, the king is killed. So what king is killed? They can't believe it. I don't know Dr. King has been shot and killed. I'm at the movies. I don't know, right? Don't leave the house. Your life's in danger, right? I go, what? We're coming up there. These are my students, right? So four or five hours later, because the whole city was now suddenly plunging into a riot, and what was happening was, uh, and I was starting to see it, and the fires were breaking out and right out, outside of my apartment. And I was like, oh, my God, what's going on? Three or four hours later, the, the students show up and telling me all these war stories about what it was like. They were in Florida Avenue. That's where they were calling me from. They were in Florida Avenue calling me up. They were trying to shut down SNCC and the organization that they were with. Their strategy was to shut down the school to shut down really the commercial strips of Cardoza, um, excuse me, of 14th Street, Florida Avenue, U Street, for a week. Mm -hmm. 
to have a week-long memorial to stop everything in the city to honor Dr. King. The looters were everywhere. They couldn't stop it. They couldn't get the looters to understand yeah, it was, it was that looting is not revolutionary, is not political. Yeah. They were just jumping. The other thing, of course, being for Washingtonian, being Jewish Washingtonian, uh, not my family in particular, but my relatives' families were a lot of the owners of these stores. Yeah. Okay? Because there were a lot of Jewish-owned stores mm -hmm. that were being destroyed. In fact, some of these store owners accused me of directing the looters to their business. Right? Mm -hmm. As if I had any control over this or any intention of doing this. But these are longtime family friends. That was a whole other thing to come overcome, right? And David, too, was accused of being involved with all this. <clears throat> so the next day, we go walk up to the school, right? And there was a thing I learned that I didn't know about. There was a big decision to shut down the school, and the authorities said, absolutely not. We want as many kids in the school so we can control the situation. Mm -hmm. So the kids who did, about a third of the school, comes to the, Cardoza, the students at Cardoza, come to the school okay. with loot. Uh -huh. Yeah. They're, they, they're like this with clothes from clothing stores, with jewelry, with everything, right? Labels and all. I go like, no, 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 this is not what this is about. Larry, take whatever you want. No, that's not what this is about. So, you know, this, that whole contradiction is happening. Then there's, I mean, I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but then what they decide they're going to have an assembly. And Reverend Fauntroy comes to Cardoza. And the, there's a quiet and a hush over the auditorium, and he sings the Negro National Anthem. Hmm. And there's a, like a real grieving memorial happening, spontaneous, with, with Reverend Fauntroy. When the whole thing is over, and whatever words were said were done, I go up to my room on the third or fourth floor, overlooking downtown Washington, and I look out the window, and I see... Smoke. Columns of smoke coming up 14th Street. Columns of smoke coming up U Street. Columns of smoke coming up 14th Street. And I go like, good God, the place is a whole... I'm surrounded by fire. Still not understanding where I was and the situation and the severity of it all, right? And I'm just looking at this like, oh my... And I can see, I can see the National Guard moving in because they bivouac on the football field mm -hmm. of the school because it overlooks the whole of the city. And I'm going like, good God, what is happening, right? And meanwhile, I was also involved with the Committee for uh, the Citizens for Emergency Support, which we were organizing with Arthur Waskow and Sue Oren, I'm sure some of these people, yeah. Betty Garman, you know, all these other people that were involved with, and I was involved with about how we would respond to a, a rebellion in the city, a riot in the city, and how we would deal with the whites and the fear, the paranoia, yeah. and how we would address the issues of equal justice and social justice restorative justice. <clears throat> Kids run into my room. Larry, where is your car? I go, it's right down the street. Come on, we're going to take you out of here. I mean, what are you going to take me out of here? Where am I going? You're getting out of here. Your life is, there's no way you can get in your car and drive out of here. They're stoning everybody. If they see a white man driving, a white person driving, they'll attack the car. So a flank of kids circle me. Mm -hmm. These are my students. And I've been talking lately with several of my other colleagues. Each of them have a rescue story yeah. where their students came to take them out. These kids surround me, and I'm trying to peek up. and am like, get down. We don't want anybody to see you, right? And literally, they're surrounding me, like, in this big, huge ring. And I'm, like, walking, like, crouched, right? Can hardly do this, right? And we go out of the school. We walk down Clifton Street, right, to my car. They throw me in the back seat of my car on the floor. Three of them are sitting like this with their feet so I can't get up. I'm tr it's a complete role reversal. I'm trying to go look to see what's happening. They're screaming, <laughs> you want to get us killed? Right? And this one kid, I, God, I wish I could remember his name and see if he's alive. And <clears throat> he's driving the car. I can hardly see over the steering wheel. We drive down to 13th Street. Right is 13th Street and drive all the way up to East-West Highway, cross over East-West Highway, and come down 16th Street, mm -hmm. right? 
At Euclid, they get out and walk back into the Cardoza community. I get in my car and I drive towards Georgetown. It's Friday, where my family always gathers uh -huh. at the Levy's house yeah, right. for dinner, Friday night dinner. And uh, on my way, I stop at Sidwell Friends, the campus. And I come to the campus, which I had visited several times and had talked about Cardoza, and there were some things going on between Cardoza and Sidwell trying to talk about how to deal with racism, right? And what happened was <laughs> the kids were throwing Frisbees in the, in the front field. I'm going like, what the hell is going on, right? <clears throat> These people are so privileged and so... And I'm, I'm making all these assumptions. I walk in, I bust right into the <clears throat> the principal of the high school. Calm down, I calm down. He explains to me, Larry, these kids live on the other side of the park, and we're trying to figure out how we're going to get them home. Mm -hmm. And we're just, they're out there. They don't know how serious the problem is. Mm -hmm. So there's all of that to contemplate. Mm -hmm. And then I go and drive into Georgetown. My parents... And the rest of the family don't know whether I'm alive, dead or alive. <clears throat> and I start telling them everything that's happened. For the next two weeks, three weeks, the Citizens for Emergency Support are organizing, you know, support. The school is shut down. We're all involved. Bail, food, trying to help everybody, you know, involved. I mean, it, it was just like a whole other state. A you know political situation. Um, this facial hair. I made a statement to myself. I said because I never shaved for the whole week. I hardly ever showered, rushing around. Hardly ever slept. And I said I never. The idea of having facial hair never even occurred to me. And I said I am not going to shave this facial hair off until there is social justice in the city of Washington. And this. I've had a mustache, I've had a goatee, I've had a full beard, I've had many iterations of this, but I've never been clean shaven ever since that day of Dr. King and all of the rebellions that happened afterwards, right? <clears throat> so, towards the end of all this, I'm going over to Institute for Policy Studies, and I'm having discussions with Stokely and H. Rep. Brown and some of these, and Ivanhoe, and they're saying, Larry, listen. We really appreciate what you're doing. We really understand what you're doing. We really value what you're doing. But we need people like you to go out of the black schools and go into the white schools. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I go like, but, but, no, that's where you belong. You want to be part of this struggle? That's where you belong. That is where the work needs to be done. So I apply and get a job with Montgomery County Public Schools. This is the last year, right? Yeah. And... Uh, I want to go teach in Poolsville, Gaithersburg, or Harrisburg, uh, Hyattsville. I want to go teach poor rural Maryland, right? I could have got a job. I couldn't get a job at the way it happened in Prince George's or whatever, right, county. I had looked at Fredericksburg, at Frederick, Maryland as a possibility, right? I got the job at Montgomery County. I go to the placement office. They can decide the placement. They say, where do you want to teach? I said, Poolsville, Gaithersburg. Hyattsville. And they go like, no, 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 we're not putting you there. What do you mean you're not putting me there? They said two things to me that just tells you how institutional racism was operating at this point. They said, first of all, you have four years of teaching and two master's degrees. To put you way up there is a waste. Mm -hmm. The boys are going to Vietnam. The girls are going to be beauticians. Why would we put somebody, an asset like you, up there? I go like, because that's exactly where I'm needed. You couldn't handle those kids anyhow. And I, with all my arrogance, said, I just spent four years at Cardoza. I can't handle those kids. Maybe that was true. I don't know, right? But that was my response. I ended up getting a job at Walt Whitman High School. Walt Whitman High School, the, the head of the social studies department was Dick Abel. Dick Abel was an old progressive teacher, my fifth grade teacher from Sidwell Friends, a legend, right? He became, he and I started working there. I said, I'm going to stay at Walt Whitman. And I'm going to stay in Montgomery County because if you're going to be a change agent, you have to stay put. You cannot leave. You have to be a permanent part of the community, right? I said, I'm not even going to go political. I'm not even going to, I'm not, I'm going to stay in the closet in terms of my politics, mm -hmm. right? The first, second, or third week of school, I'm walking in the afternoon once again. I'm walking somewhere. Um... 
I know what it was. I was making I was making a boutique big sheet called Free Free Our Schools. It was some big political statement about schools. It was some big sheet that I was making in the art room that was after school project. Um, free Our Schools. As I'm walking to go do this work, this kid, Roger McDonald, comes running down, one of my students comes running down the hall with leaflets. I don't know what they are. He said, Larry, take these and just say yes. I go, what? But before he could explain anything to me, the vice principal, former state trooper at, at, at Maryland Police, stop right there. You know, I stop. The kid stops. He said, what are you doing? What's your name? You know, to the kid. I'm a brand new teacher. What's your name? And we both explain our name. What are those leaflets? They're for the moratorium against the war in Vietnam. Why, what are you, why are you putting them up? You can't be putting those things up there. You have an organization? Yes. What's your organization? The moratorium against the war. And who's your faculty sponsor? Mr. Aronson. I'm like, damn, damn. I've blown my cover. Are you the... Yes, yes. So we start to organize the moratorium. Now, the moratorium was a Saturday event, but we get more radical, right? We start to decide that we're going to get involved with the mobilization against the war. So, and when I get to Walt Whitman, let me also say this. All of the teachers at Walt Whitman are saying to me, oh, wow, you went to Cardoza. You, that must have been really rough and really, really difficult. It must have been full of drugs. It must have been full of crime. No, no. The black schools were not full of drugs in, the, in those periods that I was teaching. Crime was not the big, huge problem that it later became. Where were all the drugs? They were in, Car they were in Walt Whitman. Yeah. That place was a drug bazaar, an open bazaar. I would walk across the quad the first couple of weeks. Moroccan Mishmakan, Colombian black whack. Kids were literally selling the drugs in the quad, right? And, you know, so the, the difference between the two was, was so stark, right? So we started organizing the mobilization for the mobile, which is, which is going to be a walk out of school, right? This would have been 69? Yeah, 69, okay. 70, right? And uh, so what well, we did plan this whole thing, right? And uh, now we, we're planning a teach-in, and so we had a teach-in at the Unitarian Church down the block. A third, I'm foreshortening his, a third of the school and two or three teachers, Dick Abel, myself, and somebody else, I can't remember, walk out of the school. That is not protected speech, okay? That is not tinker protected speech. To walk out of the school is a disruption. So I'm doing some real serious radical stuff here, right? We go down to the Unitarian Church, and we start a series of teach-ins against the war. Rennie Davis was there. Mm -hmm. Sue Warren was there. A bunch of my, some, some Panthers were there. Some SNCC people were there doing this anti-war teaching, right? And uh, so I was becoming even more radical. Meanwhile, I'm getting even more involved with the anti-war movement. I'm getting more close to and involved with the Panther Party, and what is starting to happen is I'm getting approached by people who I don't recognize and have never met before who are telling me that they're Panthers and they're suggesting some things to me, some actions which are highly risky, highly dangerous, right, As and wanting me to be a part of it. And I'm saying, this is agent provocateur stuff, right? i got to get the hell out of here, right? And... Uh, so, by hook and crook, something starts to happen. Because I said, if you stay as active as you are, and you start running around with weather, and you start running around with the Panthers, you're either going to end up in jail, dead, or in Canada. Mm -hmm. I, a friend of mine, Judy Coburn, mm -hmm. who was going out with Sandy Jenks, mm -hmm. again for the New Republic, was now at Harvard, said, Larry... Uh, Sandy got a hold of me, and he's looking for, why don't you apply to Harvard Ed School? I said, Judy, I'm making a, <laughs> I'm making a revolution. I don't got time to go to some ruling class elite credentialing organization to get yet another, the hell I need another graduate degree for? She said, Larry, you don't even know what's going on. You don't even know who the faculty, anything is. So I started looking into it, and I go like, hmm, this could be a really good thing. Maybe I should do this. So I apply to Harvard Graduate School of Education, right? I write in my 
in my application, my letter. I am a Marxist. I don't know what that means. I want to study Marx. I'm a Marxist-Leninist. I don't know what that means. I want to study all this. I want to write the history. I want to study the history of educating black children at public expense. And I want to also research and write the history of the teacher movement, in the unionization of teachers. And then I want to end up teaching in a teacher college and preparing teachers based on my years of experience. I feel like there's no way in the anti-apartheid struggle that somebody in an admissions application says, I'm a Marxist. I want to challenge all this, right? I got a $10,000 government fellowship to Harvard. And it suddenly occurred to me, this is a graceful way out. I don't look like I'm running away from the struggle. right? And when I got to Harvard, Bowles and Guinness had written the book, were writing the book, Schooling in Capitalist America. right? Sandy was with Daniel P. Moynihan revisiting the Coleman data, which was the major, major government-funded research on what happens with all the Title I money that was going to all of to compensate for the desegregation. The southern schools were desegregating. The government was finally pouring money and the government, the federal government was pouring money into school districts to co as compensation for desegregation. Mm -hmm. What happens to that money? How is it? So they wanted to look at, at, at the results, right? And they came up with the Coleman data. It's called the Coleman Report, right? It was the largest sociological study ever conducted. It was a huge sample Rural, urban, suburban school children of every background, right? And the conclusion that they came to was the one factor is not more books in the library, more teaching, more salaries, any of the things you might think makes the difference in education. The one difference is mother's years of schooling in terms of achievement, staying in school, graduating, mm -hmm. right? Mother's years of schooling, right? So I was up now after those five crazy years in Washington. I was now at Harvard, right? Mm -hmm. And I was reading Marx, and I was reading the history of, I was reading Horace Mann Bond, Julian's father's history, mm -hmm. the history of education in Alabama, a study in cotton and steel, mm -hmm. which was a Marxist history of education in Alabama, which he later wrote into a larger book. That, education of the Negro in America. I was reading all the great black historians. I was studying Marx, right? I was getting a, more grounded in theory, and I was making reflections, and I wrote my qualifying paper on educating black children at public expense. So I was getting some meeting and some history about what I, the work I had just done, and I got out of the city safely. I want to stop, interject right here. This leads us into the last question of this interview. Now you've left DC, your activism in DC is over, but you're becoming an activist in, in Boston. So um, I want you to say a few words about what you what you did in those subsequent years. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but just a few a few minutes. Um, and also um, how the, all the stuff in Washington impacted what you did in, in, um, in Boston. Well, okay, so, you know, uh, Having said that to the young man that I'll never write the book, mm -hmm. now that I'm 77 and I finally gave up literally teaching, because I even after I retired in 2007, I continued doing a lot of work in Boston, I'm now, re I'm now writing my memoirs. And these are the questions that you're asking, yeah. I'm looking at. Yeah. And so there's one of the things that, 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 one of the big takeaways is that my whole life in this title somewhere is going to be serendipity. Because... The fact that I was where I was, I was at the right place at the right time. It was magical, right? And it was transformative. Yeah. And I didn't come from a graduate school and then, okay, I'm going to apply what I've learned to my work. I went to graduate schools later, like Harvard, to figure out what is the meaning of what I'm doing? What are the history, but and what's the context in which I'm teaching it? So... It, what 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 I came to even what what I understood was the, the critically important role of public education, public education, mm -hmm. the liberating power of personal narrative, 
the importance of multiple narratives, because what I started to learn from all of this was, and then I also started working with Howard Zinn up at Harvard, and I started teaching the people's history of the United States, and th that gave even more meaning and more direction to what I was teaching, and that became my alternative. But it was the critical role of public schooling for our democracy in consciousness raising and in activism, right? But not being rhetorical and ideological and indoctrinating, but to try to do all that in a way that gets students to become independent, lifelong thinkers, but activists. And that what's so important about all this, and Washington was my hometown, was that you're not going to be able to do anything. And I stayed in Cambridge, which is where I was teaching for all those years. Um, I never left the city. I was once at an alternative school called the group school, and then I later went up to the high school in 77 until I retired in 2007. I stayed in the community. The importance of connecting to the lives and the lived experience of the people you're teaching and the fact that I was in a place where I was able to do this, because in both Washington and in Cambridge, I was pushing and pushing and pushing the envelope. Uh, I, it's some reckless ways and some profoundly important ways, and I was always trying to make it, but I never lost, make sense of what I was doing, but I never lost, I don't think I ever lost my conviction that, that public education are the cathedrals, if you will, the citadels of our democracy, secular, and the classroom, especially in history, is the crucible. And that is where liberation pedagogy is going to happen. The demography of your classroom, the lives of those people, the lived experience, no matter what the backgrounds are, right, is really hugely important, and their understanding of that narrative and the narrative of their lives. So I was able in Washington to have the field work, if you will, Find your voice and tell your stories. Mm -hmm. Know the history. You write your history. You make your history. Right? Mm -hmm. Ask the questions. Learn how to ask the thoughtful questions. Learn how to do the research. Learn how to do the inquiry. Like, uh, re-examine and question. Never stop questioning. And never stop doing the community work that's so important to the teaching. That's well, all began in my time in Washington, and I was hugely lucky to be here. It was my hometown. It was the capital of the... I was living in the belly of the beast, right? You know, uh, this was the most expansive years of, of American imperialism, of American capitalism, and we were starting to raise all the questions about the war, about the civil rights movement, and what a better place to do this and to come to this understanding than public high school and uh, in history. So, yeah, that's the, what I, the big takeaway, right? Uh, thank you, Larry. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's my pleasure. I love telling the story. <laughs>